Today's first reading is a reading from the book of the prophet Zephaniah. Shout for joy, O daughter Zion. Sing joyfully, O Israel. Be glad and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed the judgment against you. God has turned away your enemies. The ruler of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You have no further misfortune to fear. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, be not discouraged. The Lord God is in your midst, a mighty Savior. God will rejoice over you with gladness and renew you in love. God will sing joyfully because of you as one sings at festivals. The word of God. Today's psalm response is, cry out with joy and gladness. Cry out with joy and gladness. God indeed is my savior. I am confident and unafraid. My strength and my courage is the Lord who has been my savior. Cry out with joy and gladness. With joy you will draw water at the fountain of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, acclaim God's name. Among the nations, make known God's deeds. Proclaim and exalt God's name. Cry out with joy and gladness. Sing praise to the Lord for all glorious achievement. Let this be known throughout all the earth. Shout with exultation, O city of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Cry out with joy and gladness. Today's second reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word of God. Peace be with you, everybody. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The crowds asked John the Baptist, what should we do? He said in reply, whoever has two coats should share with the person who has no coat. Whoever has extra food should share. The tax collectors came to be baptized and they said to him, and what should we do? He said, stop collecting more than what is prescribed. The soldiers asked him, and what about us? What should we do? Don't practice extortion. Do not falsely accuse anybody and be satisfied with your wages. Now the people were filled with expectation and all were asking in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered and said, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming and I am not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into the barns and the chaff to be burned in the fire. Exhorting them in many ways, he preached the good news to all the people. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was 22 years old, I took a long trip, a long road trip with two of my friends. Bill Droll, John Erb, and I drove an old dilapidated Dodge Dart, remember them? Dodge Dart, we went all the way to Mexico. We drove uh, through Matamoros, which is adjacent to Brownsville, Texas, and we went up and down the mountains and finally got to Mexico City. Then we went on even further to Acapulco. It was 4,000 miles by the time we got there. Then we drove up the middle of Mexico and entered the United States again through Nogales, Arizona. So we were in Mexico about a whole month. We slept in cheap motels, 
We slept on the beaches, and sometimes we slept on top of the car to avoid the tarantulas. <laughs> a highlight of the trip was our visit to Tepeyac, which is a town outside of Mexico City. And there we heard the story of the Virgin Mary appearing to Juan Diego. Many people in many countries have had visions of the Blessed Mother, but this was a game changer for Native America. And you know the story probably. In 1492, of course, Columbus arrived in North America. And only 29 years later, after he came, in 1521, Hernando Cortez conquered the Aztec nation. Now, before they came, before the Spanish colonization, Mexico City was a beautiful city. It was an, had an Aztec population of 5,000 people. They had a beautiful temple, perfectly lined streets. They had a university and public education. Cortez comes and he smashes down the beautiful temple and he builds a Catholic cathedral on top of it. He had no regard th for their native spirituality. In just 29 years, the Aztec population went from 100,000 to 10,000 through warfare and white people's disease. The Aztec people were totally demoralized. They told the Spanish, look, you destroyed our temple, you stole our gold, you raped our women, you tell us that our gods are no good, but your gods are just gold and sex. So just let us die. We're done. Just let us die. So 1521 was the symbolic death of Native America. And that's exactly 500 years ago, 1521. But 10 years later, in 1531, something very dramatic happened. Juan Diego was a peasant farmer who watched this devastation happen. He saw his own Aztec people be decimated by the conquistadors. He himself had been baptized by the Spanish missionaries. Maybe he wondered why he was baptized by them. One day he was walking to Bass, and he had a vision of the Virgin Mary. She was dressed in indigenous clothing. She looked like an Aztec princess. Mary told him, tell the bishop to build a temple here on this Tapiac Hill in my honor, and I will bring great blessings to the Aztec people. It was like God speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. I've come, I've heard my people's cry, and I've come to restore and rescue you. So Juan Diego went, as he was told, to the bishop. Of course, the bishop did, refused to believe this peasant. He told Juan Diego that he needed a sign. So Mary told him to pick some roses on the Tepeyac Hill, which was kind of unusual because it was December. And he wrapped the roses in his cloak, came to the bishop, and he opened his cloak, and all the roses fell on the floor, and this beautiful cloak had the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And many of you have seen that. How many of you have seen that down in Mexico? I know a lot of us have gone to Chiapas and been able to see that. Mary's image had a Native American face affirming the oppressed Native Americans. An angel resembling an indigenous god of the region was at her feet, and this affirmed their culture, even their religious nature. And she was pregnant, signifying that Native Americans would be born again that Jesus was hidden, but he was present. This all happened on December 12th, 1531, exactly 490 years ago today. And that became the symbolic resurrection of Native America. For the first time, Aztec people wanted to live. They wanted to get baptized. They stopped thinking of the Spaniards as their enemies. They intermarried with them. They soon formed the Mestizo, or the mixed race, that we know today. A new cathedral was built on that Tepeyac Hill, and it became a sanctuary where the rich and the poor could come together, where they could rebuild a more just society. The Aztecs realized that God was on their side. Just the way liberation theology says, a preferential option for the poor. God is for everybody, but God has a special preference for the marginalized and poor. Mexicans today, believe that Our Lady of Guadalupe was God's messenger to them. And she is still with those who suffer, those outside the centers of power. She stands with the poor, the conquered, the people that are excluded. And she demands that those who are in power 
change their ways and change their policies. Mary is brown-skinned, unlike the color of the Spanish colonizers. She sides with the poor, dresses like them, is barefoot like them, just like Jesus who came as a poor Palestinian in an occupied country. And Mary proclaimed to the Native Americans, God is with you. You, di you have dignity. You count. Brown lives matter. The Gospel today tells us about another messenger from God, John the Baptist. Like Our Lady of Guadalupe, John the Baptist came unusually dressed. He wore camel's hair. He ate grasshoppers. He was a nonconformist. And he spoke truth to power. He condemned King Herod for killing his own brother and marrying his brother's wife. He told the religious leaders they were a brood of vipers. He warned the people they better shape up or else. Now what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? How did he describe him? Jesus said, what did you go out in the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind, a wishy-washy, feel-good preacher, someone who preaches, I'm okay, you're okay? Was he a man dressed in purple, soft playboy king living in luxury? No, he was a prophet. And more than a prophet, he was a tough-as-nails prophet. John the Baptist was an archetypal wild man. We need more wild men, don't you think so? We have a lot of macho men, insecure men who put on a tough exterior, but we need more wild men, people who have those tough virtues of self-confidence, authority, clarity, decisiveness, risk-taking, tough love, speaking truth to power, willingness to pay the price. He confronts injustice rather than trying to be popular and fit in. He shows us a healthy masculinity. Last January 6th, white supremacists stormed the Capitol building and they displayed a patriarchy gone berserk. They were violent, destructive, abusive. They showed a toxic masculinity and macho power. On the other hand, look at the police officers who defended the Capitol that day. They displayed masculinity at its best, a healthy masculinity. In their hearing before Congress, they told us what they did. They bravely stood up to the physical and racist attacks upon them. They put themselves in danger in order to protect lawmakers and the Constitution. They showed the virtue of magnanimity. They brought to their jobs a great courage and a large spirit. They served a good cause much larger than themselves. And we thank them for showing us what real men are all about. People came to this wild man, John the Baptist, and they asked the question, what are we to do? Notice John doesn't answer them by saying, you should pray more, you should go to church. He doesn't offer any pious practices or theological abstractions. When they ask him, what are we to do? He bluntly says, if you have two coats, give one coat to the person who doesn't have a coat. If you have extra food, share it with the hungry. This is impossible to misunderstand, isn't it? If you got two coats, give one to, does anybody have two coats? Anybody got extra food? This is what he's talking about. Maybe if John the Baptist were here today, he would say, if your country has more vaccines than they need, share them with the countries that have no vaccines. John the Baptist gives a concrete economic answer to the question, what are we to do? Take care of the needy. Look out for your neighbor. Work for a more equitable society. Level the playing field. Sometimes this means giving a coat to somebody in the cold, or it means giving a Wegmans card or a Topps card to the hungry. Other times it means changing unjust structures, like racism. So John refused to divorce the spiritual life from the ethical life, and he preaches what we call today the social gospel. Now in Luke's gospel, this question is asked a lot. What are we to do? And there's always an economic answer, not a pious answer. So the tax collectors come up and say to the Baptist, what are we to do? Don't overcharge the people. Don't cheat them out of money. An economic answer. The soldiers come up and they say, what are we to do? Don't extort money from the people. Be content with your pay. Economic answer. Later in Luke's Gospel, 
A rich young man comes up to Jesus and says the same question, what am I to do? Jesus says, sell what you have and give the money back to the people you defrauded. An economic answer. When the lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do? Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan who gives two days wages to the innkeeper to take care of a stranger he's never met in his life. An economic answer. Today, we could ask, what are we to do in our workplaces? There's an economic answer. Don't extort unjust profits from the people. Recently, as you know, Frances Hagen became a whistleblower on Facebook. She said, Facebook prioritized the growth of the company over safety of its users. And she put the public good over Facebook's big profits. She said Facebook was capable of changing things to help the users, but that would have cut into their profits. And she exposed it. She blew the whistle. What are we to do in our workplaces? Make sure our employees are getting a just wage. I'm sure you saw that the Starbucks employees in Buffalo this week voted to unionize. They said if Starbucks can pay its CEO $15 million, it can afford to pay its workers a decent wage and decent benefits. In John the Baptist's preaching, we hear a call to create a new and a just society. That's the social revolution that Christianity is all about. If our religion doesn't confront society, we've spiritualized the gospel. We've sanitized the gospel. We're saying it only means to have a personal relationship with Jesus, while muting Jesus' radical message of transforming our lifestyles. John is soon imprisoned after this. No surprise. You don't talk that way in public without making enemies, without being a threat to the status quo. We're less than two weeks from Christmas. For the second year in a row, COVID is interrupting our Christmas plans. The pandemic is a source of anxiety for many of us, especially Americans between the ages of 13 and 60. It has disrupted education, friendships, dating. It has curtailed having fun, making good mental health. Remote schooling and limited social interaction have led to higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. We're uncertain where COVID is going. The fear of getting it stresses us out. And that's why we need to remember the central message of Christmas, which is Christ is with us. Christ is with us. St. Paul gives us a timely lesson. Don't be anxious about anything, for the Lord is right here in your midst. So don't be afraid. So we have two mess messengers that God has sent, Our Lady of Guadalupe and John the Baptist. They both came to the world during very tough times, just like the tough times today. They want us to know that we are not alone, that God has not abandoned us. We're not on our own. God is with us in this grand challenge to transform our world. So again, St. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. For the Lord is right here in your midst. Rejoice in the Lord always. And remember, St. Paul wrote these encouraging words from prison.
Oh!